it's, would it surprise you to learn that poor communication is one of the top complaints in most employee surveys? In real life, real-time communication, Russ Landis lays out a seven-point framework that shows how to close the distance and strengthen the connection. So let's hear a little bit more about Les. Les is president of Landis & Associates, a management consulting firm that provides team organizational planning, marketing, and public relations, organizational communication, employee engagement, performance improvement, and executive coaching. The firm serves clients in various industries as well as government agencies and nonprofit organizations. <clears throat> A nationally recognized expert on employee engagement, Les is the author of The Business Fable, Fable Getting to the Heart of Employee Engagement, as well as numerous articles in professional publications such as Tactics, Public Relations Strategist, Smart Business, Reagan.com, Communication World, and the Journal for Quality and Participation, Quality Progress, and more. He is the former head of a corporate communication for one of the world's largest food companies, where he was responsible for corporate advertising, public and media relations, consumer affairs, employee communication, and creative services. Landis also plays a major role in developing and implementing the company's quality management system. Let's get ready to learn from Les. Um, the point that Darlene made at the very beginning, uh, if you look at most employee opinion surveys, satisfaction surveys, motivation surveys, engagement surveys, communication continually shows up as one of the biggest problems that organizations have. You've got to kind of scratch your head a little bit and wonder why. Because in the final analysis, it would seem that communication isn't really that complicated. The fact of the matter is, though, as Tina Turner says, when people start trying to do that, they look for love in all the wrong places. <laughs> and they're not approaching communication from what I would call a framework and perspective that allows them to figure out what's the right thing to do. And so what I've created is this framework that I call real life, real time communication. It's actually been using it for quite some time and uh, I've used it uh, with many different kinds of organizations and it's important to point out that this particular model is really not for solopreneurs, entrepreneurs, but it's really for the kinds of people that you work with every day. When you've got organizations with anything more than, than probably half a dozen people, this whole issue of organizational communications really comes to the forefront in some significant ways. Now, I want to make a little bit of a distinction here. This is not about interpersonal communication. This is not about how you be respectful, how you be attentive. This is what do you do with your systems and processes to help ensure that people can really be connected effectively. So these are the seven uh, interaction, speed, Availability of information. It's interesting how that end got lost there. <laughs> Access to information, which is different. Availability is really about policy. What are our policies about the information that we're going to share? Access is about process. It's one thing to say that we've got the policy to uh, open up uh, communication information. It's another thing to make sure that people have the resources and the access to do that. Then there's relevance, inclusion, authenticity. And I'm going to talk about each one of those a little bit. How many of you have heard about the myth that employees are a target audience in an organization? The fact of the matter is, is that employees are not an audience. <coughs> they are the organization. And we get caught in this myth that what we need to do is to make sure that we tend to the audience as opposed to making sure that we engage them in the communication process. I always get a chuckle out of people who say, what we need around here is more two-way communication. My comment is, what the hell other kind is there? <laughs> say, well, you know, we're sending out messages and we're sending out memos and we're making presentations. And I said, okay, I get it. You're talking about message distribution. You know, what people talk about when they're talking about one-way communication is like, I like to say it's like one-handed clapping. You know, it may move the air around, 
but it's never really going to make a genuine connection, right? So what we want to do is make sure we get away from, first of all, this myth that communication with employees is about sending out messages. It's about engaging people in an interactive process. There are lots of different kinds of ways to do that, to shift from message sending to communication and engaging people. We really need to understand that it is truly a process where people need to be in dialogue. Uh, Marshall McLuhan was one of the great uh, communication theorists of the 20th century, and one of the key things that he said is propaganda ends where dialogue begins. Propaganda ends where dialogue begins. There's so much propaganda going on in organizations. Employees get sick and tired of it. When you have dialogue, it can bring an end to that if it's done correctly. And this one I really love. Jim Howden is the, um, is the head of Rude Learning. And everybody talks about organizational change and the challenge that we have with organizational change. This phrase just really knocks it out of the park. Dialogue is the oxygen of change. Now think about that metaphor. Dialogue is the oxygen of change. People literally suffocate in organizations because we do not have effective dialogue in order to master, to master what we're trying to do with change in organizations. How many of you have heard about the cascade? Let's cascade this information down to the organization. Top level, next level, next level until it gets down to a cesspool of information that collects at the bottom, right? What do you do with that? Well, here's what you do. You shift to this metaphor. Instead of a cascade, you think about a fountain where information is constantly flowing up and down, up and down, up and down in a continuous virtuous cycle. So get away from the cascade. Start thinking about the fountain. Speed. There used to be a time maybe when the employee, the monthly employee newsletter was an effective way to get information out and to share things with people. It's preposterous in today's organization if it ever was a rational thing to do initially. Organizational communication must operate at the speed of life. Spontaneous, instantaneous. So what do you got to do with your systems and your processes in order to ensure that information is able to be shared and to have dialogue about that information in a truly constructive and productive way? Then we go back to the point I was making before. Availability of information. What is your policy about information that's going to be shared with people? My model is, unless it's truly some kind of a corporate secret, you need to make sure that you have a policy that says every bit of information that people need in order to understand where we're going and be able to do their jobs should be available. That's the policy point. Then we get to the access point. It's one thing to have a policy that says we're open. We're going to have open book management. We're going to be sharing information. It's quite another thing to make it possible for people to access that information. Sometimes when you come up with a policy that says, okay, we're going to be open, the next thing is, oh, is okay, <clears throat> but I dare you to try and find it, right? So let's find a way that we can make sure that if we've got a policy for openness, that we have a process for access that really supports that policy. Like I say here, availability without access is like having a key without knowing what door it opens, right? This one here. Organizations really have begun to embrace the notion that we really do need to be more effective in sharing information. Sometimes, instead of thinking about it rationally, what they do is just do information dump, and people get overloaded. Like I say here, you've got to avoid the trap of giving too much information that people don't need and giving them more that's really what they do need. Understand what people need. Understand what people want. Really make sure that the relevant information is the stuff that people have access to uh, very readily and openly. Inclusion. <clears throat> On the flip side, we often think that, well, you know, Darlene doesn't really need to know that information, so we're not going to include her in this conversation, or Cynthia doesn't, or Deanna doesn't need that kind of information. So it truly is. If you, I like to think about an organization very much like a human body. It's an organism. It's an organism. And cutting someone out of the communication loop is literally like cutting off the nerves to part of the body. It becomes inert, ineffective, and can't contribute. So be very clear about who it is that we're cutting out of the loop when we're establishing our communication processes and protocols. 
And then this last one is authenticity and transparency. I love this quote from Warren Bennis. You know, we, got, we hear corporate buzzwords all the time, right? And the use of buzzwords in the business arena anesthetizes you to the truth. It just freaking makes you numb. Let's get away from that. Let's really be sure that when we're communicating with folks, we're getting away from corp speak and we're talking with people in a truly genuine, authentic, and transparent way. And here's some of the key things that you would get if you were really focusing you know, the value of authenticity and transparency. <coughs> Problems are solved faster. Work is done quicker. Costs are controlled better. Teams are built easier. Relationships are more authentic. Employees are more trusting. Performance levels are higher. People feel more in the know, and it reinforces open and honest communication. So this is sort of the, the fundamental ethos of this whole model, is to really understand that we've got to come from a position of authenticity and transparency. I'm going to give you one example. We are all familiar with the town hall meeting, right? And this is the typical approach. You get a business update, there's some presentations, you get acknowledgement and recommendation, and then you say, does anybody have any questions? What happens? Crickets. Or you get the same three people every month who want to come up and be heard, right? What's another way to think about it? This is the standard approach. Now, how do we take the model, the real-life, real-time communication model, and apply it to our town hall meetings? You go through this first part, update, presentation, acknowledgement, conduct a Q&A. But here's what you do instead. You pose a question to the group. Say, what is it, you know, I just got done talking about a new product that we're going to be introducing. So I want you to get in groups, small groups of five, six, <coughs> talk about what you think we're going to need to be able to do in order to be successful with this. Then I want you to pick one person from the group who's going to talk about what you guys discussed. <coughs> now, all of a sudden, the silence that you typically get from a Q&A, the room bursts open with conversation. In fact, I dare you to try and stop people from talking when it's time to hear from the groups. So all of a sudden you go from the silence, you have interaction, you have conversation, you have dialogue, and people get truly engaged. They report to the entire group. You sort of identify what are the key themes we're hearing here, and then you follow up with summary and actions for everybody to understand what did we get from you? What are we going to do with what you told us? So can you see the difference between the typical kind of town hall meeting and what this is able to produce in terms of interaction and the quality of the input that you get from everybody on the team. Um, this is a, I guess I'll just call it a basic kind of do-it-yourself assessment tool where you can literally look at every single thing uh, that you do for communication. Then you can rate how you're doing from a scale of one to seven on the right. And you can do that with yourself, or you can do it with a communication professional, or whatever you want to do. But this is available for anybody who wants to uh, use this. I'm happy to send it to you. Feel free to do it and use it in whatever way you'd like. Um, I worked with a Baldridge Award-winning company some time ago, Wainwright Industries. Don Wainwright, who was the president of the company, was um, a truly kick-ass kind of guy. He was a Green Beret. He was a football player. All of a sudden, he sort of got the light when they started going for the Baldridge National Quality Award. And communication was always one of the key things that kept coming up. And I talked with Don, and this is actually what he told me. I used to see people talking and ask why they weren't working. Now I see them talking, and I say, thank God they're communicating. I've come to believe that communication is everything. Organizational communication done right is everything. And using this model, you can find a way to make sure that it's most effective. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions, comments, anybody? Mark. So in what areas of, I guess, daily interaction are people not communicating where they should be more? Is it about the daily accounts? Is it about company policy? What? What do you feel the main yeah. breakdown is? Yeah. So there are a lot of different ways to have daily communication. Some of you are probably familiar with what is called daily stand-ups in a lot of organizations, looking at the priorities for the day, what are the things that we're trying to grapple with, uh, what are the things that need to be addressed. That kind of thing is very valuable and very important. You still need to make sure that just literally talking with people, 
what are the processes that we need to put in place to ensure that you are informed about the things you want and need to be informed about. One of the other things is actually a weekly improvement huddle, which I think I talked about in last month's session when I was talking about systematic continuous improvement. If you have a weekly huddle, 30 minutes, where everybody has the opportunity and in fact is encouraged to come forward with the kinds of things that they think can improve the way that we're doing work today, tomorrow, you know, next month, next year, then you're always making sure that you've got a process in place that ensures that people are heard. I mean, people desperately want to be heard, but they're often afraid to speak up or they're reluctant to speak up for a whole host of reasons. So you just got to make sure you've got some kind of a process that addresses all the various kinds of communication needs. Yeah, Dale. Yeah, Les, you reminded me of when I was in corporate and I would have a weekly meeting with my direct reports and in that meeting, they would set their goals and priorities for the coming week in that public forum. And I only interjected when I thought that maybe the priority was wrong. And even then, I didn't say that. I asked the question, why is this a bigger priority than that? Yeah. And more often than not, I found out it was I who was lacking knowledge, not them. So uh, as you say, a very, very powerful tool. But because they were engaged in setting their own goals and priorities, um, they embraced them, they act on them very quickly and, and effectively. And I minimize the amount of time that I had to spend in monitoring what was going on. I want to underscore something that is implicit in what Dale is saying. This public accountability is much more powerful than manager or boss subordinate accountability. I mean, there are all kinds of games that get played in that dyad. When you get an entire group that says publicly, here's my goals, here's what I'm responsible for, and you have the entire group to help hold you accountable for it, you're much more likely to move forward with the things that need to be done. So thanks, Dale. It's a great point. Great example. Anything else? All right. Thank you all very much.